or good morning. If you're joining us online, welcome to Saturday Night Live Tree. We're finally in December, the home stretch of the year 2020. And we talk a lot here at Life Tree about how worship and praise reorders our minds and our hearts towards our Father. December is the perfect time as we celebrate the birth of our Savior to change our posture, to change our song and our tone, the tone that we've accepted 2020 to be, and move from despair to gratitude, from mourning to joy, and from fear to hope. Tonight we're going to celebrate that Jesus Christ came to earth to be born so that we may live forever in heaven. So would you stand with us as we prepare to sing and rejoice together? First, we're going to open in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you that you came. Thank you that you always have our best interests in mind. And we just thank you for bringing us this far. We love you and we praise you and we give you glory and honor. We're going to rejoice in you tonight. We ask you to have your way in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. We invite you to sing with us as we rejoice together. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain, Jesus Christ is born. Well, shepherds kept their watching or silent flocks by night. Behold, throughout the heavens there shone a holy Go tell it on the mountain. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed the Savior's birth. Tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Christmas moon. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Sing, go tell it. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. suffering he chose to be born in the middle of a genocide god knows suffering he chose to be born as a minority and a refugee god knows suffering he chose to come from a place where people said no good thing could come from god knows suffering he chose to be poor he chose to absorb pain he chose to be powerless and both i just love what she wrote about suffering and she goes on to say that God moved himself into our world and entangled himself in the suffering with us. He is Emmanuel, God with us, even in our suffering. Let's adore him together tonight. Oh, come let us adore.
before we sing this last song tonight. Think about his promises. He's a man of his word.
your voice and sing it with us. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Oh yeah, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. You never stop, even when I don't see it. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you're a way maker. Way maker, miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. One more time, you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Right, let's just take a moment. Take a moment and pray with me, if you will. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that you are the one who can make a way. And God, we ask you, Lord, we ask you right now to be at work in our lives. Lord, we might not see you, we might not understand what it is that you're doing, but you're at work right here and right now. And so God, I wanna pray for everyone who's listening whether in person or listening online, that right now, you would prepare our hearts for what it is that you want to say to us. I believe you've got a message that you want to plant deep inside our hearts and in our souls. Lord, so I ask you right now, would you prepare us to receive that? To receive your word, and would it, or once it's planted, would it bear fruit in our lives? Lord, would you produce something good out of it? I believe that everyone who's listening is listening for a reason. And that as you're here, and that as we've come to meet with you, you've got something that we need to hear for the coming days and weeks. So we just give you permission right now to speak whatever it is that you want to speak. Not just here to check off a box, say we attended a service or listened, but to receive from the living God what we need to live this life right here and right now. So we welcome you to do that in this moment. In your wonderful and powerful and strong name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. At this time, I will dismiss all of our kids, grades kindergarten through fifth grade, to head on out to Treehouse Kids. You'll see, uh, I think that's Ella there holding up the sign, the Treehouse Kids sign, so they can all head out there. And any parents, if you'd like to leave too, this is your chance. <laughs> You can head, no, I'm kidding, you're not allowed. Um, but uh, as they're doing that, as the kids are heading out, I just want to welcome you to Life Tree. I'm Pastor Dan. Thanks so much for, uh, for either attending or, or tuning in. And I just want to direct your attention. I believe we have a video announcement for your viewing pleasure at this time. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Life Tree. Here's what's happening. Last week, we announced that we are helping local families in need by getting gifts for their kids for Christmas. And Lifetree, you showed up. We have almost claimed all the tags that are on our website, which is absolutely incredible. We have just a few more tags left. So if you are wanting to participate in this project, we encourage you to go to wearelifetree.com slash gifts and claim your tags today. All tags must be claimed by December 8th. Now, there are three ways that you can help. First, you can purchase, wrap, and drop off your gifts to the Lifetree office, or you can order your gifts online and have them directly mailed to the office, 
or the third way is you can donate directly to the Sharon School Gifts Project by going to wearelifetree.com slash gifts. Super important to know if you are wrapping your gift, make sure that you put a tag on it with both what the item is and also the family number that it belongs to. All gifts must be sent in by December 16th. Again, if you want to participate in this project with us, just go to wearelifetree.com slash gifts. The other thing that's important for you guys to know and you'll want to get your calendars out for this one is that we have some important dates coming up. First, we will be meeting together for our Christmas Eve service on December 24th. That Saturday, the 26th, we will not be meeting together for Saturday Night Life Tree, but instead, we'll be coming together on Sunday morning for our Sundays at home. On January 2nd, we'll be coming back together for our Saturday Night Life Tree service. As always, if you need anything at all, never hesitate to send us an email to connect at wearelifetree.com. Thanks for being with us today. We're so glad you're here. You guys hear me all right? Everybody hear me? Okay, good. Yes? Yeah, okay. Yeah, good. All right. So, uh, yeah, awesome. Uh, if you want to participate at all, encourage you to check out the website. Our website is always wearelifetree.com and all those backslashes, gifts, give. Just come up with words and see what you find. Might be some hidden pages on there. I don't know. You can go check it out. Um, so all sorts of good things coming up uh, and, uh, and thing, yeah, all sorts of announcements. So if you want to check out anything, you can do that there. Um, so... Here we are. Here we are. We're in December of 2020. We've been, uh, it's, it's a year, huh? It's been a year. Um, we are in the first week of Advent, technically, because Advent is the first four weeks leading up to, uh, the f- leading up to Christmas. And so since we're Saturday, it's still technically in that first week, and we didn't. So we're, we're, we're claiming the first week of Advent right now. Um, I know a lot of people are eager to celebrate Christmas this year. Um, it's just been an interesting and lousy year in some ways, and so I know a lot of people are just really in the Christmas mood. How many of you are starting, you're, just, you're doing everything possible to get in the Christmas mood? How many have trees up already? You got a tree up already. All right. How many uh, are of you are already, you made Christmas music, you're deep in Christmas music, right? Uh, Christmas movies, you've been watching your Christmas movies. Okay, how many have actually watched It's a Wonderful Life yet? Because that's the one that's like, that's really, Katie, you have, I mean, seriously, like, there's very, like, that's like hardcore. Like, that's like, I'll wait till, like, okay, Christmas Eve, maybe. Um, you know, Zuzu's Petals, I don't know. Um, Christmas cookies. Anybody make Christmas cookies or yet? Okay, overachievers. Okay, overachievers. Anybody got your Christmas shopping? Actually, I made Christmas cookies, but that's not surprising to anybody because I just like to eat cookies. So that was really it. Um, anybody got your, your shopping done? Seriously, everybody look around in contempt. Go ahead, look at them. Just give them the scorning, shameful looks. All right, uh, decorations, right? We just, I mean, everything, we're, we're going all in. I've, how many of you have had trees up for like more than, like since before Thanksgiving? Anybody? Yeah, we've had a few. I got a few, okay. I mean, they're just people that like can't get it up soon enough. Um, I think even I, I, the clothes we wear changes at Christmas time. You start seeing Red John's got a nice Snoopy sweater on. I can appreciate that under his, he's playing guitar. He had some Snoopy with the lights on, uh, the doghouse. I mean, we're just getting ugly sweaters out and all, all that stuff. Lots of, you know, f- red flannel. Like my son's wearing red flannel, looking good, looking festive. Um, it's kind of the whole purpose of Advent, actually, all of this. So the purpose of Advent is to build anticipation. It's to set this sense of like, oh, we're looking forward to something. Like, it's not just trying to get in a mood, but really the purpose is to build that sense, that anticipation for what the birth of Jesus meant for all humanity. Now, some of us are just doing it to get out of this year and to try and lose ourselves in, like, Christmas a little bit. But really, the heart behind Advent is to build this sense of anticipation that good is coming, that Jesus is coming, and that there's something that we can look forward to. And each week of Advent focuses on a different aspect, a different word, Um, a different kind of part of the story of what Jesus meant for the world um, leading up to the day that we actually celebrate his birth. And so the focus for this this first week is the word hope uh, and how the prophets of old kind of looked forward in anticipation being prophetic and things like that, looking forward to the Messiah, the Savior of the world, that through the ages, God has planted hope in the heart of his people. It sounds like, oh, that's a great message. We should listen about hope today. This is going to be a good one. And I I hope it is a good message. Um, 
And one of the people whom God has planted hope in, one of those prophets, just so happens to be Isaiah. And that's been our verse for the year. You're like, oh, no, no, don't worry. I'm not going to. Yeah, I am a little bit. Sorry. Uh, something new comes from Isaiah, who is one of those prophets long time ago, who God spoke something about Jesus coming. Um, and so our verse, uh, I, will, I will read it. It won't be on the screen, but I'll read it. You know the thing we've been talking about all year, that this was going to be a year God was going to do something new. Mm-hmm. All that goes with that. Um, he says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator and king. You should know this by now. You've heard it I don't know how many times. Um, if you've been part of Life Tree, if you're new to this, hey, welcome. You get to hear it. I am the Lord who opened up a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I called forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned their lives, snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. Remember, it's a great candle. It's Christmas. Okay, there we go. But forget all that. It's nothing compared to what I'm going to do, God said. For I'm about to do something new. I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness, and I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. And as we're preparing for this Christmas series, think, okay, what are, we, what are we supposed to be sharing? What message, God, do you have us bringing at this time? It just stuck out to me that God has always been, is, and will continue to do things that we don't see. He has always been, continues to do things we just don't see. And perhaps we're not looking for it. Perhaps we don't understand it when we do see it. Um, Perhaps we just can't see it. I don't know. There's a lot of things in there. But the truth is that God remains at work in our lives whether we see it or not. We can agree on that. God can do things, and he's not bound by our ability to perceive it. God just works. And uh, as I reflected on the passage, it just jumped out at me, right? He says, do you not see it? You hear it, right? Do you see what I say? Right? I mean, I'm like, come on, it's Christmas. Like, oh, there's something Christmas in this passage here. And it absolutely just jumped out at me. It's in the song, right, that it says, do you see what I see? That the one asking that question is actually the wind, the wind in the sky. They're saying, you know, do you see what I see? And it's creation, and it's talking about the star. Saying, do you see the star? Do you see it? Uh, the coming of Christ, Advent, right, has always been about an exercise in vision, in sight, Are you able to see, in anticipation, are you able to see what God is doing? Because there is a lot of times we can, we just don't know what God's doing, and we don't see it. And the question's being asked of us because we're missing it. And vision is all about what we hope will be but is not yet. That's what hope is about, right? You hope in its future. I'm hoping for something that isn't a current reality. I don't hope for things that I have because I already have them. So I only hope in things that are not here yet. So again, I just want to invite you to read Isaiah again a little bit more with me, and and this will be on the screen. And as I read this, just sort of listen for what you feel like, what words are in here that are jumping out at you. So we're going to read this. It's It's a good one. It says this. It says, out of the stump of David's family will grow a shoot. Yes, a new branch bearing fruit from the old root. I mean, come on, that's so good. Root, you know, root to fruit, right? So much good stuff in there. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in obeying the Lord, and he will not judge by appearance nor make a decision based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor and make fair decisions for the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his word, and one breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked. Verse 5 says, He will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. Don't try and picture that. Okay, verse 6, here we go. In that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. Aww. Aww. It says the calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion, and a little child will lead them all. Verse 7 continues. It says the cow will graze near the bear, and the cub and the calf will lie down together. The lion will eat hay like a cow. I mean, a lot of animals, a lot of animals. We're getting, picking it up. A lot of animals here. Verse 8. It says this, the baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put his hand in the nest of deadly snakes without harm. It just stands out to me there, babies and snakes. Where have we heard that before? Right, you go back to the beginning of the story, and Jesus says, I'm going to put, I'm going to make snakes and, and humanity enemies. And he's saying when, when God's going to do something good, there's going to be peace restored there. Just interesting there. Verse 9. It continues, nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. I think one more verse, verse 10, it says, in that day, the heir to David's throne will be a banner of salvation to all the world. The nations will rally to him, and the land where he lives will be a glorious place. 
All this was meant to create hope. All this was meant to create this sense of hope. Again, Isaiah, God speaking through Isaiah, it was, it was not just Isaiah's words, God speaking through him. I mean, how many of you are feeling it, right? You're feeling it? Don't worry. I'm going we'll to we'll make a point with this, but just stick with me. Read just a little bit more. We're going to go back a little bit further. You should know this passage uh, if, you've, if you've been to, to church or grown up in, in faith at all. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, and it says this. It says, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. Verse 3, it says, you will enlarge the nation of Israel and its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest and like warriors dividing the plunder. Such a good word, plunder. All right, verse 4. For you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders. You will break the oppressor's rod just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. Verse 5. I know there's a lot of references in here that we haven't had time to really break down, but just I'll explain in a moment. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. There will be fuel for the fire. Essentially, there's going to be no more fighting. That's what he's saying here. Verse 6 goes on and says, For a child, have you heard this? For a child is born to us. A son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called, oh, so good, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And it continues, verse 7, his government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David for all eternity. I love this, how it ends. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. Hmm. So, I don't know if you heard it, but in those 16 verses between Isaiah 11 and Isaiah 9, one word was repeated 36 times. There was one word repeated 36 times. I know you didn't catch it, did you? Like, no. Did anybody catch it? Maybe? No. Okay, it's the word will. The word will is repeated 36 times in 16 verses. 16 verses. See, God is promising things that will happen. It's about hope. It's about what will happen. And you know, it's funny because what will happen hasn't happened yet. It's future tense. And so it just stands out to me over and over. This is what's, what's going to happen, right? That something new is going to come from something old and that, that bondages are going to be broken, right? That there's going to be freedom, that there's going to be light, that there's going to be all sorts of good stuff, you can go back and read them, that the animals are going to get along, that there's going to be no more fighting on the earth, right, that um, a son is going to be born, that people are going to rejoice, that all of this fairness and justice, goodness, all this stuff is going to flood, all this stuff will happen 36 times. God is a God who likes to promise things. And as good as that is, as much as what I'll call the wills <laughs> give us hope, that's not what should give us the most hope. Because there's one verse that I read in there that takes a different tense, only one. There's one verse that takes a different, and it's verse 6 of chapter 9, and it says this, For a child is born to us, and a son is given to us. Two times in that verse it uses the word is. Thirty-six times we hear will, these two times we hear is. And it's really interesting. That's the perfect tense. It means it always is. It's just perfect. Always is. He is, has been, is, will always be kind of. His name, I am, it's just eternally in the present. He's saying that child is born, and it's really interesting because he's saying that 700 years before Mary ever met Joseph, <laughs> right? Before they ever took that road trip to Bethlehem, before the angels announced his birth, before that star lit up the sky, God has already made the decision to give his son. It was a done deal. See, we live in the tension here between what will be and what is. But God lives in a land where what is, he can talk about it as it will be. Right? To God, they're the same. And I think we often misunderstand what will be to be what we hope it will be, what we want it to be, what we're you know, crossing our fingers that it will be. But that's not what hope is about. See, the stunning truth of creation is this. What God says will be, already is. What God says will be, already is. There's no doubt. There's no possibility that it won't be. And I, I promise I'm going to go somewhere with this. I think here's the danger. Sometimes, this is what I'm going to try to make it really practical. Sometimes we confuse 
hopes with wishes. I think sometimes we confuse hopes with wishes. To wish means to desire, to want, um, to determine in your own mind, to will. And here's the thing about a wish, right? It originates in you and in me. That's where wishing starts, right? What do you want for Christmas? What do you want, right? It's, it starts with us. It, it originates in you. You conjure up the idea. You pour your effort into willing it into existence. It's got this internal origin. So it originates. Wishing originates inside us. It starts with me. And it's usually about something outside our control. So it originates with me, and it's in the hands of things, of forces outside of us, right? Has the great potential for heartache and disappointment because I really want it, and I have no control over it. So I'm wishing for something because if it was in my control, I would do something about it. So we wish for things that we don't have power over and that they will become reality. So originates in me goes out there. Um, it's something you want that no one has promised to you. Do you understand? That's a wish. A wish is something you want, nobody has promised it to you. And here's the thing, wishing isn't wrong. It's fine. The danger is when we confuse wishing for hope. See, what you wish for isn't always going to happen. And the consequences of confusing those two are severe. See, if we're not clear and we confuse the two, then we can come to believe that God has promised us things that he hasn't. They're just things that we wish for. I don't know if this is making any sense at all, but it made sense in my head. And so what happens is then we begin to, when those things that we feel like we wished for, that originated in us, that depended on other things, that God never promised us, when they don't come to pass, then we come to the conclusion that either God's not good or he doesn't love us, or he's not able, um, he's not loving, he's not powerful, any of those things. It was Frederick uh, Nietzsche that said, hope in reality, hope is the worst of all evils because it prolongs the torments of man. Oh, boy. Hope is the worst of all evils because it prolongs the torments of man. Hope is terrible, he says. You know why he says that? Because he confused hope and wishing. He, he, he absolutely came to the right conclusion. That when you wish for things that you have no power to control and they're not given to you, hope is, is devastating. Right? That's why broken promises are so hurtful. It's because you've put all your trust into something. You counted on that thing. You had this expectation it was going to be there. And when it's not, when that carpet is pulled out, oh, man, that's painful. We can wish for things and they may happen, but we have to just recognize that there are some things simply not promised to us. Conversely, Hope originates externally. See, hope is a promise made by someone else, created by someone else. Right? Hope isn't something that we conjure up. Like we're going through life and somebody says something and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I didn't have any hope, but then they said this or then they did that. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, maybe. Right? Like, like I got a, a phone call. Maybe, you know, maybe somebody showed some interest or maybe something, maybe there's a possibility. Like it, 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 something else outside originates it and then all of a sudden hope is that seed of hope is planted. And you're like, oh, the source of hope is others. And hope is also based on things outside of your control. Um, it's dependent on the actions of others. I don't hope for things, again, I have control over. If somebody says something, oh, I hope that's going to happen, and I have power over it, I go do it. If somebody says, hey, that restaurant is great, I don't go, oh, I wish somebody would take me there. I can go there. Right? I can just go in. Now, if there's something I can't do, then, again, I, I, I'm hoping. I hope that somebody else will step up and make it possible. So hope is founded and dependent on trust, a belief that it's going to come through others. Hope demands confidence. You can't hope like wavering. I think we confuse those words so often, hope and wish, that we don't even know how to separate the two. But hope isn't wishing. It's different. Wishing is things that you want. Hope is belief. It's confidence. It's assurance. It's the belief that the same God who said he would son, send his son and did, and the same God who said he would rescue you, that he will, that the same God who says he will guide you is guiding you, and that the same God who said he will never leave you never has. It was uh, Desmond Tutu, the uh, archbishop in, in uh, the Anglican church, who said, hope is being able to see that there is light despite all the darkness. See, hope is is a confidence that defies the reality. 
is not just wishing, it's belief, it's conviction. Hope sees what is and understands what will be and has no problem connecting the two. And that, what, and that makes the greatest danger here, treating hope like a wish. If we think that we're just wishing for something, if we think that God is making all of these promises and that's just wishful thinking, it may or may not happen. What happens is that we underexpect. We don't count on it. We hedge our bets. We make decisions today based on what happens if it doesn't come through. We fail to commit. We don't go all in. We hesitate. We hold back. So we can, we can treat, we can, we can treat hoping like a wish. When somebody makes us a promise, we're like, well, they may or may not. And that's, that's got its own set of, of dangers. But then if, if God makes us a promise and we're like, I'm not sure, then we don't go all in. We don't commit. We don't believe him. There's no halfway with hope. It demands courage and confidence. Hope is our strength. So what? Okay, here's we go. I'm going to try and make this really bring this to a point here. It's critical that we see wishes as wishes and hopes as hopes. And here's why. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promises. So we need to hold the things that we want, that we desire, that nobody else has ever promised us with open hands. And conversely, we need to cling to the things that God has promised us. And that happens when we identify the source of the future that we see. See, if what, you, if what you see starts in you and God has not promised it, it's a wish. Does this make any sense? I hope it's making sense. Again, it's not, it's, not based, it's, it's, not, it's not bad to wish for things, but we're talking about promises. We go back and look here about all those things God said he's going to promise you. And there are so many times that we have things that we wish for and things that we, we, affil- we attribute to God. We say, God, you gave me this. You promised me this, but he never said that. And then when we get let down or it doesn't happen, we say, God, where were you? Again, it's fine to wish for things. We just have to recognize them for what they are. But if we see that something starts with God, do we really hope? Do we really have this unshakable, unwavering hope? Do you make decisions? Again, we talked last, last week about giving is one of those things, that when you trust God, you respond in obedience. You go all out. It's like, do you trust the ice? You're going to step on it? Right? There's the story of the, the tightrope walker years ago, right? doing the tight tightrope walker walking back and forth over a great waterfall and the crowds are cheering him on. This is amazing. He says, how many of you think I can go over this, uh, you know, uh, you know, with a wheelbarrow? Yeah, they're cheering. Yeah, we believe, we believe. He says, that's great. How many think I can go back and forth on this wire with somebody in the wheelbarrow? Like, yeah, we believe, we believe. Everybody's cheering. Yeah, this is amazing. This is great. He goes, okay, who wants to volunteer? It's one thing to say we believe. But do we really? And I just want to encourage us, as we're anticipating and getting ready for hope, our hope is not based on the possibility that God will do what he promised. It's based on the certainty that he will. Jesus is going to forgive you if you go to him. Jesus is going to provide for you if you will trust him. Jesus is going to give you wisdom if you will ask him. Jesus is going to take care of you if you will follow him. Right? All of these different things, right? this is where faith really comes down and hope comes down. And I want to invite you to, to consecrate our hope. And we're going we're gonna to move into a, a communion today as sort of the way that we, that we make, make this an action step in, in just a moment. And in, in just a minute, I'm going to invite the band to come on up and start to play a little bit. But I want to just challenge you and ask you to think about this for just a moment. What kind of things are you wishing for? And did God say that? And secondly, what kind of things did God say? And do you trust him? Do you trust him? Again, let's go back to that, that passage there in Isaiah. God says, listen, I'm doing something new. Do you not see it? 
Do you see what I see? Do you hear what I hear? Do you understand what I'm doing for you? Trust me and follow me. And again, he calls us out. And as we walk towards Christmas here, and it's almost here, it's crazy, but as we get into this and build that sense of anticipation, I just want to encourage you. Everything that you put your hope in God about, it will not be disappointed. The scriptures tell us that that hope will be a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It will never, ever let us down. Communion, as we, as we uh, I think everybody's been served. If you have not been served, uh, just please raise your hand and our ushers will make sure that you have, you have some things. Okay, they'll, they'll come find you. Keep your hands up and they'll, they'll find you. And if you're, if you're watching online, um, you can either pause or run to your refrigerator and get a little drink and a piece of bread or whatever. Um, but I think communion is one of the most hope-filled traditions that we have. In eating together, we're declaring that not only did Jesus live and die for us, but that we're confident that he will return again. And we'll spend eternity with him. It's not a wish. This is the good thing about communion. It's not like that promise Jesus made about eternity. Like that's not something we conjured up. That was a promise made to us, and we can trust that. It's a hope, a promise made by God, and it's dependent on his actions. It's completely outside of our control. Our hope is sure, and he's going to do that. So I'm going to invite the band to come on up. And uh, if you haven't guessed, we are going to close in, in just a minute with the song, Do You See What I See? Because I think it's just so, it's, 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 uh, it's so timely for us today. But as you're holding those things, I just want to invite you to take a moment in prayer and, and just let God begin to speak to you right now in this moment. In this moment, I just want to invite you, as we hold the bread, as you consider it, the bread represents the body of Jesus. God said he was going to send his son as the Savior and Messiah of the earth. And he did. Again, everything God promises, it's a certainty. It's a done deal. I want you to know in your life, God says, hey, listen, you look around this world, it says freedom is coming. Peace is coming. Justice is coming. Unity is coming. All sorts of good things. Think about all of the pain and the suffering in this world. He says it's all coming to an end. It will come to an end. And in his sight, it already has. It is a reality. It's not just a Pollyanna hope that we have that someday a wish that maybe it's wishful thinking. It's done. Jesus didn't come to save us so that we can, you know, hope that he will someday. It's a done deal. It's what the bread reminds us today. That we serve a God who does what he says he's going to do. He said 700 years before Jesus ever walked on this earth, he said, I'm going to send my son. It is. That my, that I, I have sent my son. He is here. And then he did it. It's what the bread reminds us of today. So let's just pause for a moment and reflect. I encourage you right now in this moment, would you just maybe confess any doubts that you have? Just between you and God, say, God, I struggle to believe this is real. It's nice, maybe wishful thinking. But God, would you just help me today to have confident hope in you? There's so many things that we just wonder if they're hanging in the balance. God, would you give us confident hope today? Give you peace to let your heart know that you can trust him. Let's just take that bread and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the bread. Lord, it reminds us that as real as this in our hands, that you came, that you're the God who does what you promised, that every one of your good promises came to pass, will come to pass. But you make all sorts of promises to us. And 
It's not just wishful thinking, but those are things that we can count on. I ask you, God, today, as we remember your faithfulness, your trustworthiness, help us to fully place our trust in you. Let's eat together. I invite you to take the cup. And it represents his blood, a covenant promise. As Paul declared in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he said, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, does not waver between yes and no. He is the one that we have preached to you as God's ultimate yes. He always does what he says. For all God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes. And through Christ, our amen, which means yes, it ascends to God for his glory. It is God who enables us, along with you, to stand firm for Christ. He has commissioned us. And he has identified us as his own by placing the Holy Spirit in our hearts as the first installment that guarantees everything he has promised us. See, we have the Holy Spirit within us. And if you've ever sensed God with you, that's, again, another reminder and another encouragement that everything God ever said that he's going to promise you, you can trust. Every time you sense the Holy Spirit, it's another reminder. Our God is faithful. Our God is faithful. So I want to encourage you, just take a moment before we drink. Just take a moment. Say, God, let, would, you, would you help us to sense your spirit inside us? Lord, that Holy Spirit inside us, Lord, it affirms and reminds us that every promise of yours will come to pass. Thank you, Jesus. Let's drink together. God didn't make a promise and then leave. The Holy Spirit is in us. We're so thankful for a God who gives us the power to trust him and the confidence we need to walk through with unshakable hope. That's our strength today. Life's a little rough. It's been a challenging year. But our strength is not coming from willing ourselves to something. It's not just trying to manufacture some sort of positivity. Our strength comes from the confidence we have in our hope. That everything God said for us, we can trust in. It's going to happen. So I just want to encourage you, as we sing, let God be your strength today. And let that be your confident hope that everything he promised you, he's never going to fail. Thank you. Would you, would you lead us?
the voice as big as the sea. Said the shepherd boy, said the shepherd boy to the mighty king. Do you know what I know? In your palace warm, mighty king. A child, a child, shivers in the cold, let us bring him silver and gold, let us bring him silver and gold. Now oh, this is my favorite part, said the king, said the king to the people everywhere, listen to in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that you have revealed things to us or that we couldn't have seen on our own, that you promise us so much good, or that you're going to come and you're going to give us more than we'd ever deserve. Lord, help us to see what you see and to live with that kind of hope each and every day. Lord, not just wishing, not just wishful thinking, but confident hope, unshakable hope that what you say will be, it will be. It's going to happen. It's a certainty. I thank you. We commit ourselves to you this Advent Christmas season. Build in us a sense of expectation. Let us look forward everything that you've promised. In your good name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to be seated at this time. And uh, as we follow the protocols each week, our ushers will dismiss you as you leave. Again, if you have children and treehouse kids, please don't forget to get them. And uh, on your way out, if you'd like to give as well, the baskets are there. You can give online if you need to. But thank you for coming. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you next week.